blessings upon us, church, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness over this body. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in every day, Lord. And as we go through this week, Lord, we just go in knowing of your faithfulness. No matter what's going on in each of our lives, Lord, we know that you are faithful, Lord. And we thank you for that. And we worship you, and everybody says, amen. Good morning, Granby. We have just a couple announcements to go over real quick. Um, in Children's Church, this month we are starting to collect money um, for a new project. Last year, everybody knows that we collected money for the rolls of paper, and that was exciting. We raised enough to get two big rolls of paper, so that was awesome. But this year what we're doing is we're going to put those rolls of paper into practice and into work. So we're collecting money for Bibles that those uh, paper rolls will make. So for $10, it makes a Bible and then also gets the Bible shipped out across the world. So each of the kids will be collecting money um, through this week, through the last Sunday of the month, for Bibles to be able to get sent out into the world. How awesome is that, that we get to spread the good news of the Word? From just little Quincy, Illinois, the Word goes out. So it doesn't matter how little or how big of a city or church you are, the word can still go out and go forward. So um, the kids will be collecting money for that, so make sure uh, parents, if your kids have those little white boxes, that they bring it um, back by end of the month for us. Also, Iveta Cooper, um, she is collecting um, some donations for uh, the 100 bags of love that she's doing this year. So if you'd like to donate a toy around the $5 mark, um, hygiene for teens, um, can we get an amen for that one? Um, <laughs> Medium-sized Christmas bags and individually wrapped candy. If you'd like to donate that, you can just bring it here to the office or just drop it off in the foyer and we'll get that to her. We also have a normal uh, business meeting right after the 9 a.m. service over in the adult pathway room. Uh, so if you are a member and would like to attend to that, that is following this service in the adult pathway room. And also, uh, 
ladies, we're looking at possibly doing a Christmas event. So if you are um, interested in possibly attending that, there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Um, just jot your name down, and Marilyn or Lisa will get a hold of you on um, if that goes or doesn't go. So thank you, Grandview, for being faithful and always being here. All right, Zach, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, helping get everything going here in different directions. And those of you that uh, are home watching, uh, we did have a little bit of difficulty to begin with, but hopefully we got things moving along. Also, we're going to have communion today, so if you are watching at home, um, go and take a few moments maybe and get, uh, get a piece of bread and some juice together, and we'll have communion a little bit together. So it's good to, to do what we can when we can, and at these kind of different times we're in, hopefully... Uh, just uh, uh, we'll be looking forward to getting back together in one service, being able to worship um, in one service. But then hopefully, uh, as the church would grow, that we'd need to go back to two services because of the multitude of increase. Amen? And that's what we need to be a part of and the increase. And so we send the word, and then he watches over that word that is sent. And we believe that one of the impacts of sending the word is that lives will be touched and changed in Jesus' name. And that is what we want to be a part of. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and get them out. We're going to look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, in just a few moments here. But I want to talk a little bit today and encourage us and stir within us about the wonderful, blessed gift that we have in our life of eternal life. Uh, you know, Christmas uh, is here, and, and I, I guess it's just a good reminder that Christmas is bought and paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so many times we, we get a following after the Lord and, we've, and we're in this for a time and we're looking for something new or waiting for God to do something new in our life. And it's just good for us to stop and just to, to realize and have a great revelation of God's love for us and what he has already done for us so that we can receive from him, that we can experience um, what he has already provided for, in us, for us in this life. And oftentimes where it comes to Christmas, um, uh, people go and they put it on the credit card or they put it uh, on layaway or they do something that they're going to have to pay for it later. But I want you to know that the blessed gift that God has given to every single one of us through our Lord Jesus Christ, this blessing of the gift of salvation, eternal life, that should so excite us, that still should thrill us from on the inside of what Jesus has done for us, has already been bought and paid for in our lives. That there's nothing more that we have to do to pay for it, nor is there more that God has to do to bring this blessing of his way of living for us right here, right now. And, and you know, Christmas is a great time for us just to stop and, and think about what God has done for us and the blessings in our life. It was recently I was talking with an individual and he was saying, I was just getting a little dis you know, depressed, a little down. He said, I just sat down and I just started to write things that I should be thankful for, things that God has brought into my life. He said, it didn't take me long to fill that page and all of a sudden it started to change my attitude. You know, folks, if we're not careful, we focus on what we don't have or what maybe God hasn't done yet in our life instead of focusing on his word and what he said he has provided for us May I even add, more importantly, why he did it? Because of his great love for us. This would be a good time to turn to someone you can see and just tell them God still loves you. God, God, still, God still loves you. You know, Christmas is that time we, we have this, this gift-giving idea, but we oftentimes, we put a limit on what we can afford to give. We, we look at someone and we think, well, I wish I could do more for them, but there's a limit on what I can do for them. We, we think about the individuals that are around us and we, we want to bless them more than what we'll get back. And, and sure, we've all got kind of those short lists of individuals where we feel like we got to do something for them. You know, we got to get them something. Uh, but most people, when it comes from our heart, we want to do more than we can really afford. And so it holds us back. But as we look at what Christ has done for us, as we look at this blessing of eternal life, as we look at this gift that he has given to us that is beyond what we could deserve, beyond what we could afford, that we, beyond what we could even imagine that he has already given to us, church, may we today be stirred and reminded of just what it is to have eternal life. Not just living for a long time, but having the nature of God living in our lives right now. Now here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, the scripture says, for whosoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. 
but whoever loses his life in this world for my sake will find it. That is, life with me for all eternity. Now, maybe stop right here and say that when we're talking about eternal life, we're not just talking about a length. Because all of us are spirit beings, and our spirit will live for, for, from now. Our spirit will never cease to exist. It's just where will it exist for all eternity? Where will it go after this life? When we leave this body, the Apostle Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for the believer. Doesn't that put a smile on your face? But it's also good that the Apostle Paul said that wherever he was, the Lord was with him also. And so eternal life does not start when we die. Eternal life starts when we accept the gift of salvation, of the new birth, of this new way of living in our lives right here on this earth where God Almighty, by the power of the Holy Spirit, comes in and dwells us and wants us to live a new and a different way right here on this earth because God is with us in our lives. So we change. We, we in a sense, we lose our life. We lose... We, we lose control of it in one sense. We, we give it over to the Lord in our life. He goes on in verse 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains this whole world? Wealth, fame, success, but forfeits his soul. What will it gain? It doesn't mean that we can't have possessions. It doesn't mean that we can't achieve awards. It's just saying that's, not, uh, that's nothing compared to what, what God has given to us through the, the blessing of his presence and the gift of eternal life. What will we give in exchange for this? The verse goes on and says, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, a lot of people have tried to, uh, to make deals with God along the way. A lot of people have tried, you know, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. But the fact is that God has already done. He's already given us this blessing, this gift of salvation. He's already said, this is what you, you get from me, if you, will, if you will receive Jesus as your Savior. And I know that 99% of us in this room personally by name, and I know that you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, but it should change the way that we live, not just the way that we die. It should change the way we face our daily lives instead of just that day when we take our last breath. It should change, and that's the testimony that we have in our life, that we're living this life differently than the world. That our motive is not to just gain wealth, success. Our, our motive is not just how much that I can gather and contain during this lifetime. But our motive is to give our lives to the Lord. You know, when, uh, especially earlier in life, when, when, and my family, we would exchange gifts and names. Uh, we would draw names out of the hat, and so-and-so would get your name, and you would get their name, and, and you would exchange gifts according to that. I want you to know that the Bible says, what will man give in exchange for his soul? God has given us the blessing of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And he's given us that, that gift. My question to us today is, what will we give back to him in our gift exchange with him? What will we give back to the Lord in the way that we live our life? What, what is it that we possess that would be worthy to give back to him because in our family, when we did a gift exchange, there was always a, a limit on it, you know, a $10 limit. We were big spenders, you know, or something like that. But, but God Almighty has given us this eternal life through Jesus Christ. Why is it that we struggle in giving him our life back? Why is it that we struggle? Some people even struggle with giving 10% of, of their income or, or giving some extra time to come to come to church or gather together or, 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 or read their Bible on a regular basis. I'm not here to condemn any of us, but I am here to stir every single one of us up that if God Almighty was willing to pay for us to have Christmas Christ come into our lives and transform us and to change us, what can we withhold from him? Are we exchanging back? Are we gifting him back? Are we giving him everything back in our life? in our lives, in the way that we're living. You know, it's just a, a note to, to think in our life just how amazing salvation is. I was just talking with someone the other day, and I was saying, you know, sometimes I feel like on every time I preach, I'm supposed to come up with something new, something amazing, something you haven't heard of, dive into the Greek, come with some scripture that maybe you didn't even realize was in the Bible. 
But folks, I want you to know that what turned the world upside down, the message that transformed the world, the message that, that, w- that people were willing to give their lives for was simply this, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It was a message that transformed and changed their lives that they ought, could receive eternal life, God's nature to live on the inside of them. It was what transformed uh, 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 communities. It, it is what rocked the known world at that time. The simplicity of the gospel that shakes us and changes us. Is it something that we still appreciate so deeply in our life? This amazing exchange that went on. That God Almighty loved us so much. Are we still amazed at the love of God in our life? Are we still amazed that God loves us? Are we still amazed or have we come somehow accustomed to it? almost feel like we're deserving of it? Are we amazed that God loves us so much even when we have difficulties and struggles and problems along the way? Or have we given up in our life to some just level of comfortable Christianity that we can stop in our life and just every day be amazed that God loves us today? No less or no more than yesterday, but I'm having a growing understanding of just how much God loves me, and it changes the way that I live my life. Now, that's that's what the effects of his love is on us, that we have life, life that, that life and that life more abundantly, that Zoe life, that eternal life. That God-given life that he's given to us. Does that, does that stir you yet today that you have eternal life, God's nature in you? And that life that he has placed in us, that life that he has given to us, gives us supernatural liberty in us. That there's nothing that the adversary can do to defeat our lives. That sin and its penalty no longer controls our life. That we no longer live under the weight of guilt and condemnation in our life. But we've been set free by the, by the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's Christmas and we're supposed to be talking just about the babe lying in a manger. But folks, the, the, the purpose of Christ coming to the earth was to die so that we could live. And we could live free from sin's penalty. Free from its effect on our life. To transform and to change us. You know, John 3.16, and I want to read it out of the Amplified for just a moment here because... You know, sometimes when verses that it becomes so familiar that we can just quote them off the top of our head, it's good that we know the word like that, but sometimes it's good to stop and slow it down, to think about it from a different direction, perspective. John 3.16 says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. We zip over that so quick sometimes. But stop and to think the heart of the Father God the heart of the God, the creator, that he deeply prized the world. You know, if we're not careful, we as believers even can get a, an attitude towards the world. We can kind of get the same one that the disciples, when the city rejected the message of Jesus, and they said, let's just call down fire from heaven and just burn them right here. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. That was the worldly spirit. That was a retaliation spirit. And I know that there's times of judgment, and I know that there's times that the wrath of God will come upon this world. But I want you to know that that in our hearts, that we see the heart of the Father God that should be in our heart today, that he greatly prized and loved the world. Let me stop right here. Let me ask you, this week, as you are going through your daily life, whether it's school, work, driving down the road, in in the stores, whatever, as you look across humanity and you see people in the world around and many of them maybe are busy buying stuff for Christmas and they don't even know the purpose of Christmas may that heart of God once you stop and pause and just say father God give me a a heart like you give me the father's heart that I greatly prize this lost world that is around me that I'm not just looking for other Christians that that we can get together with but but give me opportunities to act like you did, to reach into this world, to make a difference in the people's hearts and lives, to give me an open door to be able to share with them the message of your love to the world that is around me. The Father God greatly prized the world. The Amplified goes on and says that he he gave Jesus 
God's only Son, the one who is truly unique, the one and only begotten Son. This, this motive of the Father God, which started the, the title with just Christmas paid for in full, and I want you to know that the price of Christmas, the price of, of, of God's love coming into our lives is that, that he was, was willing to give. He gave, uh, and we see the Father in action here. We see God the creator that is concerned and greatly prized the world that he created, but then we see quickly the Father that is willing to, to move in action here and to give his only son, his unique son, the, the, the begotten of the Father, the only one like him that he was willing to give, that he greatly prized the world, but he was willing to give that which is closest to him, part of him, to redeem us, to reach out to us. It, it reveals the, the extent of this love that he, was, that he had for us. It, it started to expose his desire to be with us and that for us to have that divine nature. We could be one with him again. That, that we're not just one with God by the coming together in a church service, but there's a, a nature, a divine oneness that comes alive on the inside of us that happens because of this amazing gift that he gives to us. That the Father gave Jesus... Again, we pause and we think about this gift exchange. He gave us Jesus. What do we give him back? I'm not here to make any of us feel guilty, but I am here to, ask, to question all of us and to just to, to tear down some of that re resistance in our life when we are resistant in giving to the Lord. We're resistant, whether it's our time or resistance in giving up maybe some of our habits, resistance in maybe even giving up some of our emotions and feelings along the way. Resistance in giving up the way we treat others that are around us. Here, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever trusts in him as Savior should not perish but have eternal life. I'll just say in my own humanity, there's some people that I would put on the maybe list when it comes to being saved. You know, if I was God, I would say, okay, probably eventually, but I'm going to let you just kind of dangle for a while before I tell you whether or not I'm going to let you in. Uh, there's some people that, that you would want to, to say you've done enough bad that, that, that I, I'm just going to at least make you sweat for a while. You know what I mean? In my own, just my own humanity. But it's amazing in this one little verse that we, we quote so quickly and we run on because we've experienced it ourselves, but we don't allow it to transform us. It, this is not just a, a picture of how God wants us to be, be born again. It is an example of what he wants his family to act like and how to treat the world that is around us. That whosoever trusts in Jesus, there should be just a, a, a whosoever mentality stirring on the inside of the body of Christ today. My greatest concern right now is that the church isn't reaching the lost at this time more than it is. My greatest concern is that in our daily lives that we're not more aggressive in sharing this amazing message about Jesus Christ. That we're not just inviting people to a Christmas celebration. We're not just trying to get people to come, you know, to church for uh, the kids to sing some song. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But, but our heartbeat should be reaching the lost. Our heartbeat should be greatly prizing the world that is around us that is lost. Our heartbeat should be, be for those that are being deceived in sin and, and can, controlled by the demonic forces. And what can we do to, to change their lives? and to reach into their lives. When we look at what God was willing to do for us, that we're not just holding on till Jesus comes, but that we are aggressively reaching the world that is around us. I'm not asking you to just do something out of, out of guilt. I'm not asking you to do something just out of mechanics. I'm asking all of us to say, Father, Father God, may your heart beat greater in my life. May your desires, so that when I come up to an opportunity to share with your love with the loss that is around me, it is, may I say this, supernaturally natural in my life. It's supernaturally natural to be able to reach into them, to care for them, and to love them, that whosoever believes in you and trusts in you would not perish, but have eternal life. That... that Whosoever, anyone could hear the message to escape not only the penalties of hell, but the, the blessing and the, uh, of eternally being with the Lord and experiencing him in their life. 
this Christmas season, it's, it's really easy for us to get caught up in either the, the, the season and the, and the traditions or getting caught up in, in the fear and, and, and the concerns of what's going on. Well, I want us to get caught up into the presence of God and what He wants to do. What would He want to do during this time? What would He want to do in your family? What would He want to do through you during this time? I want you to know that He wants every single one of us to be an example of His love, His life, and His liberty during this time. He wants every single one of us to know that God loves you. There is no greater revelation in the Bible than God is love. It is no, there's no greater revelation because there is no end to that revelation. That, that Paul said that you would know the heights and the depths and, and the widths and the length, that, that, that the love of God just goes in every dimension and every direction. And there is no limit to his love. There is no understanding of all of it. There is no greater revelation. And so there should be nothing that have more of an impact in my life and in your life personally than God's love. Yes, God loves me. I'm so thankful for that. But God wants to love through me too. That's the amazing part we see of Jesus. Not just that he was confident in the Father's love for him, but that Jesus went around demonstrating the Father's love for others. May we understand that God loves us, but then his life, when it comes on the inside of us, we love him more than this world. We love him more than even ourselves, and we love others more than ourselves. Can I get a quiet amen out of that one? Does any of that need to change in our life? Does any of that need to grow in our life? When I become confident in God's love for me, when I have a foundation of God's love for me, then I don't feed off of others' love for me. I don't need, in a sense, and, and it, it's wonderful, then we should have love for one another, don't misunderstand me, but I don't need you to love me because I'm confident in God's love for me. And when I'm confident in God's love for me, when the enemy comes to tempt me or to condemn me, I can step back in the confidence to know that God still loves me. Has anybody here ever made a mistake before in your life? Has anyone here ever sinned before in your life? A couple of you didn't raise hands. Anybody be liars in your life right now? I mean, it's all right. We've all had, and if we're not careful, especially as Christians, we can allow that guilt, that condemnation to come in there. But when we allow that to have voice in our life, we have diminished the impact of God's love in our life. And we need to just stop and realize, yes, I have made mistakes, and yes, I have done wrong, and yes, maybe I have even sinned, but I choose to allow the effects of God's love, His life, to start to transform and to change me. And when I start to have a firm foundation on God's love for me, then I'm not trying to be performing to be able to get God to love me, nor am I allowing the enemy to can put me in limits because you've made mistakes in your past. Who are you to do this or do that? This is who I am, someone that God loves greatly in my life. If he loved me greatly before I was saved, surely he's going to love me as much after I become his child here on this earth. And so we can have that confidence of his love. Then it starts to transform in the way that I live my life. I've got life and that life more abundantly. I've got the nature of God on the inside of me. I've got my father, God's DNA that has come into my spirit and has transformed me and now I've been made anew on the inside. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. It wasn't become something that I was able to perform. It's just what I received when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in my life. It wasn't that I added my name to a church uh, uh, list somewhere so I could vote on things. It wasn't because so that when I die, they can put my name in an obituary that he was a member of a certain church for so long. No, it's because when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Bible says that I get a new name, and my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which transforms the way that I live for eternity. 
You see, church, we need to allow that life to transform and to change us here, not just when we get there. And start to change the way that we then walk in divine liberty. Everyone say liberty. You know, in America, we like that word. In America, we, we like the word liberty, and we like the, our freedoms, we like our rights. But I want you to know that real liberty comes through Jesus Christ, the gift of spiritual life that is given to us. The real liberty that we have, that even like we looked at last Wednesday night when the Apostle Paul was in prison, that his body was beaten, that his, his, uh, he was put in, uh, in, in stocks at, at, nigh, at midnight at the inner prison of that place, uh, what it looked like he was very limited. It looked like he was defeated. He was in pain. He was physically limited. But the Bible talks about how he prayed and sang praises to God. When you realize that you have been liberated, folks, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world around you or even in your own personal life, you can say, Jesus still has set me free in my life. And I will not allow bondage or, de uh, or, uh, or anything of this world to limit the power of God in my spirit man on the inside. That I am free. I am free. I am free in my life because of what Jesus has done for me. And they started to sing praises to God. And the Bible says that all the prisoners were listening to them. You know, when we start speaking true liberty... When we start living out of the, the relationship and the, that we have with God in our life, when we start to live a life that is more influenced by God's love than the present circumstances that we're in, people will listen to you. People will want to hear. They're interested in what you've got to say. Because in your present situation, you should be discouraged. You should be down. You should be on drugs. Something should be going on in the bad and the negative in your life. But you still have a sense on the inside of liberty on the inside. And people want to see the outcome of what God's going to do in you and through you. And so we know how the story goes that the whole place was shaken and the, all the prisoner doors were open. The jailer and his family get saved. Amazing things happen. Well, was that a miracle of God? Yes. But what triggered the miracle was there was two men who chose to walk in liberty because of the life of God that was in them because they understood the love of God that was for them even in those situations. Christmas is an incredible time, folks. It's not just something that happens December 25th, but it should be the way that we live our life. When we think of what Christmas costs God, it should stir us up. It should transform us. When we think the Father God had to be willing to give his only son. When we think that Jesus had to be willing to pay the price of coming to this earth. Isn't it amazing? We're all trying to get out of here and Jesus was willing to come here. Think of that. And here Jesus was willing to come. Not just come as the almighty God with a host of angels. But he chose to be born in a manger as a little baby totally limiting himself from all of his, his godly attributes to be able to live this life as a sinless man, to be able to be uh, uh, sinless while the demons were tormenting him, religious people were mocking him, and at the end, even one of his own to betray him, physically going through all of the pain that he did. And then yet, even after all of that, facing death, and then becoming sin for you and for me. What an incredible story of Christmas, of God's willingness to pay the price so that we could have Jesus Christ come and live on the inside of us. God's love for us. It, it, it's incredible. It's amazing. It should be transformational in the way that we respond to him. It, it helps us to understand that, uh, why Jesus would say, if you love me, you'll obey me. When we start to really get a glimpse from this side of, of the resurrection, what a small thing for us to obey the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, to respond to him in, in the way that we love him by simply obeying our, his word, transforming our will to his will, changing our thoughts to his thoughts, changing our focus and goal to his focus and goal. In the world, it says accumulate all that you can 
Get all, you know, when I was growing up, the commercial was get all the gusto that you can. You only go around once in life, so get all the gusto that you can. I want you to know you can't, you only go around once in this life. Let's get all the souls that we can. Let's get all the loss that we can. Let's get all the glory for God that we can. We only get one life to live down here on this earth. Let's do it for Jesus. He did it for us. Ephesians chapter 1 starts to unfold again. This, this incredible, uh, amazing love that he has for us, the life that he has given to us, and this incredible liberty that we now have in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 6 through 8, the Amplified says, to the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he has so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, his son Jesus Christ. He's basically saying that through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, here is some of this amazing freely uh, uh, grace and, that has been given to every single one of us. Verse 7, in him we have redemption. In him we have redemption. That is our deliverance and salvation. Folks, as you start to unwrap the gift of salvation in your life, as you start to unwrap the free gift that Jesus has given to you, I want you to know there's deliverance in the gift of salvation. There is, there is provision in the gift of salvation. There's healing in the gift of salvation. There's peace in the gift of salvation. As you start to unwrap this gift, it's just incredible. All that God has already given to us. And when we understand that it is because he loves us, that he wants these things to come and pass in our life, we stop to try to achieve it or feel that we're unworthy of it. In one sense, we are unworthy, except he made us worthy by loving us. It's incredible as he goes on. He says, in him, we, in him we have redemption. You know, uh, I, I'm, I like to kind of uh, wait for, for gifts and things like that. Uh, um, other people in my family are a little different than that, but... Uh, when, when, if someone gives me a Christmas gift, for the most part, I'm going to put it under the tree and we'll wait till Christmas. Uh, recently, my mother-in-law uh, gave me my birthday card. My birthday's not until this coming week, December 10th. And so um, I put the card off to the side. Mary's like, well, open it up. I said, well, it's not my birthday yet. I got to wait. I got to wait for that date to open it up. You know, too many Christians feel like they got to wait till they get to heaven to open up the gift of salvation. Too many Christians feel like they got to wait till a future event happens before they can receive the blessings and the benefits that God has already given to us. But God has already redeemed us. And in that redemption, he has already delivered us. He has already saved us. And we've seen last Wednesday night that he is our Savior. Everything that we need he is right now in our lives. And I encourage you to, to open up this amazing salvation that he has given to you. Open it up and experience it in your life through his blood which paid the penalty for our sins and, the re, and resulted in the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sins. Can I get a glory hallelujah from somebody today? If you're close enough, turn to someone and say, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. One of the most powerful, powerful declarations that we can make as, as true believers and followers of Christ with his love on the inside of us is to be able to turn to someone be even before they ask and say, you are forgiven. God forgave us before we ask him to. God paid for the ability for us to be redeemed before we even ask him to. And he's revealing to us the cost of Christmas, the cost of Christ coming into our lives. Not just a babe born in the manger, but life eternal reborn on, uh, on the inside of every single one of us. The cost was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that blood was powerful enough to cancel the penalty of sin in our life and resulted in forgiveness and complete pardon of our sins according to which his, 
the riches of his grace, the Amplified says, that has lavished upon us. You know, we're kind of in a period right now where people are more in a conservative mode, concerned about whether they'll have a job or not, concerned about whether they'll be able to afford this or that, or concerned about what's going to go on. And, 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 and in some ways, people have shrunk back. They're, they're estimating that the average person is going to spend, here it is, $50 less this year than last on Christmas. So they're really in conservative mode right now. But God doesn't ever... God, God doesn't never. God, God is, is one that just lavishes His grace on our life. It's not a word that we use very often. And many times we don't use it in a positive way. But I want you to know that regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done, that God is willing to lavish his grace upon you. There's, there's just a, almost a smothering and an overflowing of that grace that is upon your life. Naturally speaking, probably one of the closest things I can come to that is when Marilyn made Thanksgiving dinner. And we had the turkey and we had the dressing and we had, had the, the mashed potatoes that were there. And then we had the gravy that we lavished the whole plate with. We, we eat pretty healthy most of the time, but once in a while we, we do a little extra there. But, but the gravy, we just lavished it upon everything that was on the plate. I want you to know this, that every area of your life, whatever it is, whether it's physical healing in your body, whether it's peace in your mind, whether it's financial provision, a job, or whatever you need, that God wants to lavish His grace, His favor, his love, his provision over every area of your life because he loves you, because he wants to demonstrate his life in you, and he wants you to be liberated in every area of your life right now. Could you say now three times? Right now. Too often we wait. Too often we're wanting to wait until we get to heaven. Too often we're wanting to wait until we go to another place. But he wants to transform your life now. You know, as I mentioned, my birthday's coming up. 59 Christmases we've experienced. 59 years of giving gifts and receiving gifts. And I want you to know that, that most of the gifts that I could say that I, I don't remember most of the gifts over the years. I've got a couple sentimental gifts that are in a box that I got when I was a kid and they're, they're on the shelf at home. But I'll have to be honest to be able to say, there's not one gift that I received at Christmas that was life transformational. And yet, that's the whole purpose of Christmas. Christ coming to this earth is to transform our lives. It's not just so that we can have a special service on Christmas Eve. It's so that your life can be transformed because God loves you because God put his life in you. And because of that work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he liberated you. My question is, are we living that kind of a lifestyle? Are we living in a way that represents him? Just in closing, as we prepare for communion, I just want to maybe just ask you just for a few moments or just to, to look at your own life. And just ask yourself this question, is there any area in my life that I'm not walking in liberty? Is there any area in my life that I need to allow the love of the Lord Jesus Christ to have dominance, to have more impact and influence on my life? Maybe it's receiving forgiveness for some past sin in your life. Maybe it's forgiving someone else for something they've done in your life. You know, to just preach a sermon is of little influence unless you receive the word and allow it to transform and change your life. Because if we can start to understand how much God loves us, we'll start to understand how much God wants to supernaturally use us. And we'll start to have that at heart as we look at the world around us that they, they don't just need someone to give them, you need to get saved. They need someone to give them the love of the Savior and however that might manifest in some supernatural way that, you will, uh, that they will understand there is a God that loves them.
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the incredible work that you have done for every single one of us. We thank you, Lord, for redemption that's already been paid for, that we can receive, we can experience, and we can be transformed by. Father, we repent of our selfish living. We, we ask, Father God, for a greater revelation of your love. We ask, Lord, that you would use this church in this day to reach out to the world that is around us. That we're not just being Christians, but that we are being Christ-like, liberating and loving people because of that supernatural life of God that's in us. Or none of us know how many days we have left on this earth. May there be an urgency within us, especially during this time of the year, to share your love with the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. For communion this morning, I would like to do just a little bit different. For most of you, it's in the, the chair in front of you. Others, it might be a, a right in front of you if there's not a, a row. I just want to read our devotional real quickly from day four. I, 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 this has got nine different scriptures, both Old and New Testament, uh, prophets and epistles. But it kind of sums up real quickly uh, communion and this desire, that it, uh, this, this blessing that God has brought into our life. It says, To you, Father, because you loved me and sent your son Jesus to atone for my sins. And I stand amazed that Jesus who by nature had always been God, did not claim to change his rights or, uh, or did not claim to his rights or to be equal with you, to be something to be uh, hold on to, but he lays them aside. To be born a human, that he would totally uh, change himself in the sense of humility, submitting to death of a common criminal, enduring infinite uh, humiliation and pain, that on the cross that he would uh, lay on him the compressed weight of all sin and guilt and shame for all my griefs and sorrows, and he became sin for me, dying the death I deserved. And how much I praise you that it was impossible for death to hold on to him in its power, that he was raised again from the dead to be my Savior, to make me righteous in your sight, and that you highly exalted him and have given him a position infinitely superior to any conceivable command, authority, power, or control, both natural or supernatural, that you, that you are the great high priest, and that he is able to save me completely, for he has saved us forever, and he prays for us, and all that come through him, through glorify you, my Father, with grateful and joyful hearts. And I bow at the feet of him who was dead and is now alive forever and ever. I exalt him, I yield myself to him, for he is worthy of the total response of my entire being. Worthy is the lamb that he was slain to receive power and riches and glory and might and honor forever and ever. Amen. Think of what the Lord has done for you as you receive communion at this time Receive the bread of life, which represents his body that was broken on that tree for you uh, and, and, and hung on that tree for you. Receive that, that, that juice that represents his blood that was forgiving power that is in your life. That cup represents the love, the life, and the liberty that he has given to every single one of us. And that is the price of Christmas. And that is paid in full in Jesus' name. God bless you as you receive that holy communion in your life and relationship with him. He's a loving God, and he loves you. Amen? God bless you, and walk in that fullness of his presence this week as you allow his heart to flow through you. Uh, forget Wednesday night service. Right now, we have just an elder, a business meeting over in the church for all members, or excuse me, over in the school. So if you want to zip over there, we'll uh, have a short budget meeting there. And we'll see the power of God in our lives this week in Jesus' name.